if you go to my website, which is either um, beckerart.net or davidartbecker.com, and right here this week we're doing a scene with a bunch of um, David's dabs or Bob's blobs, I call them. And you can go to um, YouTube and subscribe to my channel on YouTube, and you can just see, and I'll send you like um, you just press right over here. You would press right here on this um, on the button or up here, and you go right to YouTube and you watch me paint every Thursday night for free. And we have a lesson. There's some kind of lesson in in each one I do, kind of like what we're doing tonight. And I give um, and it, these are normally just one hour. They're just one hour, and I usually get it done pretty quickly. And because I've been doing it so long that I pretty much get there. And then on Sunday, I do a demo. This is called Sunday Demo with David, where I'm just either out plein air painting or I'm practicing. And I just turn on my camera and I just have people just watch. And it's usually not something that is not a paint along, but some people paint along. They try it and I have no problem with that. And this week I did the um, Chicago Chicago theater in downtown Chicago where I used to work. And um, so I just did that just because it was still this week and it was a little bit too cold to go out yet. I'm, I'm getting to become a wimp the older I am. And so, and down here, you can go to my, on the bottom of my website here. These are products I recommend that I talk about and you can just go there right to this button right here. Products I recommend. And cause I'll be talking about some products and you can just go there to look at what I'm recommending. And here's where you sign up for my newsletter, which I do a free newsletter every week where you can just go there and I give a little hints this week. It was a little video about how to do Bob's blobs or David's dabs. It's little like gestured people. And so that's what we're going to be doing tonight. kind of in this scene too. So I'll do be covering that a little bit. And then I usually go to a value study like this one is a value study of what we're doing tonight. And so tonight I'm just going to, um, and again, if you have questions, please unmute yourself and just ask because I don't, I, I can't look at the chat, which I normally do when I'm doing YouTube. I, I, I'm not talking to you, but I'm chatting. But tonight it's a little bit different. So if you um, just unmute yourself and ask questions right away, I don't mind it at all that you interrupt. It doesn't matter. I, that's what I'm here for. So here's my um, value study. And I make, I do this for uh, my students. I tell my students is that I make my paintings black and white and make them like a you no know, tan for the um, image so I can see where the lights and darks are. And so if you, I think this is Toronto, I think, is this Toronto? <laughs> mm. The scene, I wonder. Yes, it is Toronto. Yes, it is. Okay. It is. I recognize and it. And that's yeah. uh, old city hall in the background, the tower. Oh, yes. okay. So and this is Toronto. Bay I just, I, that's I Bay Street, the financial district. Looking. I'm sorry, go ahead. That's Bay Street, the financial district in Toronto. And okay. the tower, the bell tower, is the old city hall. Oh, okay, nice, great. I'm glad. I, I'm glad I picked up from Toronto. It's hard to. It didn't say what it was, but I'm thinking there's a Canadian flag in there. I'm thinking, okay, I think <laughs> <it's> Toronto. <laughs> and so, um, and I love doing rainy street scenes. That's what I've been known for doing Chicago scenes. But I thought I want to do Toronto and see. <laughs> I've done enough Chicago scenes. I want to try some other ones. And I'm doing it on a. Um, let me take you to the um, my supplies. I use Holbein supplies, uh, Holbein and Legion papers. I'm using Stonehenge Aqua aboard, and um, I'm using Holbein watercolors. And my brushes are um, Holbein brushes also. They're Holbein golds. And um, Holbeins are great colors because they don't dry out. And it's really a nice thing to have. And so we'll go right to our tabletop and this painting. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so I drew it up. And um, I changed a few things from I saw some tangents and stuff. And I, I look at my again, I go look at my value study and I look at the, for tangents and look for areas that like if you see this whole side right here, these flags are right on the line right here. And um, there's a couple of things this this pole was right in line with this building. And so things like that I look for the tangents and stuff. I know it's just a small little thing, but in in my black and white, you can see that the black and white, is showing a little bit more where the tangents are or where I can, I wanna go flip over these. I wanna open up the flag and show the flag and and put this thing that right on the edge there. And it, it also shows that the tower is not that, it's in my light area. So I, I teach that I teach with two values, the black and white and the middle tones you decide when you're painting, if they are towards the light or towards the dark. And I make a halfway point where it's either the light is part of the, the grays are part of the light or the area. So these buildings back here, I'm going to consider as part of my light. And I will not make them this light, but they're going to be lighter than any of my dark, my lightest darks. 
I have to separate that. You have to separate those two between the lights and the darks. And so that's what I use. That's why I do make it black and white. And I also put high contrast in there to get rid of the grays. And that's called more of a no tan design. And so I kind of really into that lately. And so in the beginning of the year, I start my classes on YouTube. They're all free. And I start them up with one color, two color. And so right now it's like with the third month, January, February, March. Yeah. And so... <laughs> We just, everything just keeps on going and going more and more. And so you can go back to each one of those videos too, to see what I had done for the first you know, week in January, second week in January, third week, because it's basically starts from the beginning again, every, every January, first one in January, every Thursday, I do this every Thursday night. So then we go do that. And so let's just get started. And I always, I have a, a thing called the Becker three step. Um, it's a way I paint every painting I do is in three steps. I do the first step is my lights. And so I'm just going to, and also I, I, I'm not sure if you notice, I put out gouache. So I use gouache now and it's watercolor. It's just opaque watercolor. So I'm not sure why people are thinking that's so different. Gouache is watercolor. Um, if you use uh, not acrylic gouache, but watercolor gouache is watercolor. It's just opaque. And especially Holbein now, it doesn't put whiting agent in their paints so that it makes it um, white and pastel-like. Though I like those colors, I like in my watercolors, I have pastel colors. I have pink, I have, um, you know, violets, lilacs, lavenders, you know, I have those colors and they have white in them, but I use them as a watercolor. And sometimes I use them as a gouache and I use my gouache for that when I need to cover an area a little bit thicker. And so I use gouache. They're both can be used together because they're both watercolor. It's just that the watercolor is transparent. The uh, opaque gouache is opaque basically, but still pigment as a water media. So I'm just going to wet my background and start doing my lights first. My step one is my lights and creating my color scheme too. That's what I was doing when I was talking. I was putting the paint on there and this has a little bit of white and light blue in there. And so I was just putting my lights down basically. And so, um, and I just take it down and put it through everything because everything besides this will be dark, right? And so I'm just on my step one, I do all my lights I do all of my lights. I bring it right down to this guy. I do the street right away. Anything I need to color. Um, and I'll use a little bit of gouache. Sometimes I'll use a little bit of paint. The gouache is a little bit more opaque. And so sometimes I'm just using it wet and just bring it right down into the paper. And so I'm, I guess I also said that, see how you see a little bit of, um, I'm not sure what that has like acne <laughs> for some reason. I'm not sure why this paper is doing that. I must have got a bad sheet or something. And so I'm just taking my lights and I'm, it's going to be like, basically I'm using my cool colors now. And I go over here, the lights are on in this little building over here, which you guys probably know which this building is, but I'm not quite sure. I've never been to Toronto. It's really funny. I've been through Toronto many times on the highway 401, but I've never had actually had to stop because I'm always heading to Ottawa. So one of these days I got to stop into Toronto. <laughs> And so I'm just going to put like my warm colors here. I'm just going to take some orange and just kind of warm that up. And again, I'm basically putting down my warm colors in the foreground. And these are all the light colors. I'm not looking for my dark colors yet. That comes in step two. Step two is all my mediums and darks. And so I'm just making fun washes. And, and today in my class, I have a class on Wednesdays now. Um, and I was just telling my students is that basically water is always put down the same way. You either put it a hard edge or a soft edge, and um, you get it either wet in the wet or wet on dry. Wet on dry gives you a hard edge. Wet in the wet gives you a soft edge, right? But you want the watercolor just to do its own thing. Watercolor is so wonderful because you never have to do anything. It does it for you. Basically, you wet it, like right here. I'm just going to put some, some paint, some water, and then I'm just going to take the paint in any color you want. That's another nice thing. You can use any color you want. Just look for the values. And then just put them in there and then just let it float and let it blend itself together. Let it do its thing that watercolor does so well. One thing that watercolor does really well is blend itself together with different colors and gives you really beautiful colors. And it gives you like, if you spatter, you get little dots. And if you um, get granulation, depending on what kind of paint you use, and it all happens on its own. You don't have to rub it to smooth it out ever. That's another nice thing about um, watercolor. You never have to smoothen it out. It always just smoothes itself out because you need to add water. It's basically add water to your water and to your watercolors, and they'll do their own thing. 
And so they're basically my lights, right? And, and everything that's up here is going to be in the street because the street is basically wet and it's rainy. And so it'd be like doing a lake. It'd be like basically doing a lake. And um, it run, runs right into the street because it's reflective. It's like a mirror then. And I'll put this a little bit up here. And again, these are my lights. Step one is creating your values, uh, or your light values, and also your color scheme. And so basically, I'm going to go with blue and orange, kind of like my compliments. And the orange will just be the glow of the light that you have out there. And that that also means I could put like a reddish orange too, you know, in certain things and like the tail lights and and so basically they're, they're my lights, right? And so and now um, step two would be going in there and getting my large mediums. And large mediums are exactly what it states. It's like take they're the mediums that are more towards the dark though. I got my lights done. The the mediums that were for the light those are done. I don't want to go back into there. This actually this building right here. I got to get. It's a light building right here. And you notice I'm doing a city scene and there's a million windows. Do you see me doing each individual window? No. People are so scared about doing city scenes because they take everything so literally and want to do every little window. And it's like, eh, you can still do that, but you still start it like this. And please ask questions, guys. I, I definitely don't mind questions at all. And so now let's go to our large mediums. If you need to know what kind of um, paint I'm using, or um, color I'm using. I try to state what I'm using when I'm putting it down. So what I'm gonna do now is do my mediums. And so I'm gonna start from the back and work forward. And I can't do this building yet because that's still all wet. I will give that, that's gonna be a lighter color and it'll be pushed back, the little tower back there. And as I come forward, I'm just gonna get darker and darker, but I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with black and I use peach black. And then I put color into that black because I want it dark and gray but I want to put some, I don't want to just black. So I want to give it a dark color. And so I'll put some maybe ultramarine blue in here and the back one right here. So I'm just going to kind of go there and just kind of go down. Now I know that the flag is white and red, but I can rub that out a little bit. I'm not going to wor worry about little things. I'm just going to go in there and go right down into the, into the street because that's going to be reflected into the street. And then it gets darker and warmer. I'm going to make it a little bit warmer as I come forward. And so I'm going to take a little bit of purple, permanent violet, a little bit darker, and maybe a little bit of red, Scarlet Lake. Maybe a little Scarlet Lake. And I just kind of go through here. And I'm just going to make a nice big area of value. And I also, over here, I have gray on gray. It's a great, it's Cronacidum Gold. I hit the wrong one. As you can see how fancy my, how clean my palette is. <laughs> I don't ever clean my palette. Um, it's too, you know, that little bit of dirt that you see in there is not as much as the pigment is that the, the real stuff underneath. So, but a lot of times I mix all my greens with the blue, with the cronacidum gold. So that's going to a lot of times not be pure cronacidum gold. And so um, what was I looking for? Okay, let's get a little bit of blue and orange. We'll make a, a gray brown. And so I'm gonna take that in here a little bit. Just bring that down. David, I, I notice you're wearing gloves. Is there a reason for that? Um, I, there's about three re three reasons I use my gloves. One is it looks cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my hands don't look so great, and so it makes it look good. But it, it focuses my camera. Um, one of the biggest things is it focuses my camera because when everything's light and I'm moving around, a lot of times it's trying to focus. It doesn't know what to focus on. It's like, because everything is the same value. By, by having my black gloves here, it focuses on my black gloves. And is and so it keeps it steady, I found. And so that's like I might use it mostly for that reason. And now I got so used to doing that. And it looks kind of nice to have it dark. And so you can really see what my brush is doing. True. Very cool. Thank you. And it does keep your, um, later on, I'm going to wax this. I'm going to show you how to wax your paintings, which I'm sure um, Sarah Yeoman showed you how to do, right? Because um, um, I wax all my paintings now instead of mm -hmm. um, premium glass. And it gets me to make be able to sell my paintings for double the price now. And so um, I'm going to show you guys how to do that on this painting when I get done at the end. What do you put as the backing? Um, this one is actually a board that I actually put in, but... I have different um, backings that I put on. Some of them is uh, just plywood. Some is, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, 
plexiglass. I've sometimes glued onto plexiglass. Sometimes oh. I glue onto. Oh, what else do I glue onto? I have a, actually. There's a video I just put out like in a couple of newsletters ago where there was 11 items that I glued my paper to. So you just look for that and definitely go and um, sign up and subscribe to my YouTube channel because there's a lot of videos on there that just show you how many how many things to um, use for um, gluing your paper to. And Legion is coming out with a um, aluminum panel, which I can't mm -hmm. wait. Uh, I ordered them already. They're coming out next month. And um, it's basically, it's paper on their aluminum, on aluminum. It looks really so cool. So the watercolor paper, it's already glued to the aluminum? Yeah, it's already glued. Oh, it's a little bit more expensive because it is glued yeah. there, but it it's, boy, you can't bend it. It's just amazing. Save a lot of time yeah. and effort too. Here's a painting I did on aluminum. See, it's aluminum. It's um, it's aluminum backing. And so this is a watercolor and I waxed it. And so now I can just put it into a frame, like an oil painting. And I used a stencil and um, yeah, it's just uh, really hard aluminum. That's fantastic. Love <laughs> it. So let's see, we'll go through here. Bring this right down into the street again. And if you're doing a watercolor, just always remember that if it looks right while it's wet, it's wrong. <laughs> because you, if it looks like it's supposed to be when it's wet, you didn't make it dark enough. Because it's going to dry 20% lighter. So if it looks right and you're like, oh, that's perfect. No, it's not. It's going to get, it's going to dry. And then you're going to be like, ah, oh, darn, it got too light. So make it a little bit darker than you want it to be. You know, and then, um, then it'll be right. David, will you be able to explain to us how you do the waxing at the end? Yep. Yeah, I'm going to wax this for you. I'm going to show you how to wax it. And I even have a frame ready for it to show you how I put it right into the frame. Wonderful. Yeah, it's like I'm trying to get all my students. The, the, the biggest problem about this is that you have to get your panels ready before you start painting. You just need to have a bunch of panels that are available for you to paint. Like this is, a, like I said, this is a board. This is a board. This is a crescent board, a watercolor crescent board. And so it's already thick. It's it's on a board already. It's glued down. And crescent makes it. You can get it at like Blix, Hobby, or um, not Hobby Lobby. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Uh, Cheap Joe's has them. I think I bought, I mostly I buy them at Jerry's Artorama. I think they're the cheapest at Jerry's Artorama. And these are also pre-glued on the watercolor paper. Yep, this is a, this is watercolor paper already pre-glued pre onto um board. And it's wow. just like a um, it's like just a, I don't know what kind of board they use, but it's just a kind of a cardboard type of board. So are they uh, archival? Uh, yeah. David? Yep. Yeah, they wouldn't they wouldn't put it on a on, on an archival, unless it would be buying cheap paper. But no, it's definitely archival. These paper companies are they really know about that. They would never do that. I mean, that's the most important thing, I think, to make sure that these things are archival. And aluminum, you know, it's uh, it, there's whatever the glue is, I'm not sure what they glued on, but they had me test the paper to try to get rid of the paper, um, try to get it away from the aluminum. I couldn't do it. I I mean I I put boiling water on it. I put um, a heat gun to it, and I'm talking about a heat gun for a stripper. And um, they also do a Yupo on, their, on the panel, and they do the watercolor paper, and also the black paper. They have black paper, watercolor paper, that they also put on there. And so um, I've tried them all. I try to get the paper off of there and try to get the paper off the panel, and I could not. Whatever glue they're using, it's really good. <laughs> so here's Midazolone Brown. This is a brown, a kind of a violet, violet -y brown. I mix a little bit of ultramarine with that. And I'm just getting, getting in there with a, maybe a little bit of black too, just to make it really nice and dark and kind of pick up some of these really dark darks now. This is my big areas of middle tone, right? I was saying my big middle tones and then I get darker and darker and darker. And my last step will be detail darks, but detail darks are pretty much hard edged, you know, and then you identifying the details of your, of your painting. And so we're not there yet. We have to get our big areas first and just kind of, David, there's a question in, uh, um, from Nancy. Do you notice a difference in the quality of the watercolor paper used on the pre-made boards? Um, 
some of them yeah like yeah some of them are not that great um arches used to make on a board um but i find it's pretty simple to glue them down too it's really not that hard to glue down a paper and you just use you can use many different things you can use like a mod podge um this kind of um what do you call it ph balance adhesive you can use gel medium like acrylic gel medium and you just put it down into your onto the board and then you just roll it on there take a um like a rolling pin and let me do uh, the brush here and then just basically glue it and put something on top of it and you're ready to go and also always make sure it's a standard size it makes it so easy to frame then you know us watercolors we've always had a problem because the, the papers are never the size of any of these um frames and then we have to mat them and then we have to put a glass on them and so nothing ever fits because nothing's ever you know the same and that's where the oil painters they just gonna roll right away and put all their paintings right into a frame and sell it right on the spot and and i've been doing a lot of these plain air fests and now i decided that's it from now on i'm i'm painting to a standard size and this mm -hmm. is a, this is 12 by 16 and i got a frame ready and i'm gonna show you i'm gonna put it right into the frame right when i get done for those people that came in a little bit later, I just want to let you know, David has requested that if you have a question, just unmute yourself and ask the question, and then you can mute yourself. And don't be afraid of as asking a question because, you know, so, everybody else um, wanted to know the same thing, but they're just too scared to ask. But there's no no stupid answer, no no stupid, there could be a stupid answer for me, but no stupid questions. It's all good. So, David, right? Yes. So it doesn't matter which glue you're using, it's as long as it's uh, stabilized to the backing. Yeah, you just make sure um, you still your glue should be um, acid free. Your glue should be acid free. Oh, okay, right. Because you do want that. I mean, you don't want to have acid free. Though you know, again, you know, it all depends on how thick your paper is. You know, if your paper is really thick. You know, it's not going to get through there. It's not going to affect the paint, the painting, but it will maybe affect the how you're gluing it down and if it's going to last, whatever. Okay, so like say cold press, for example. So, uh -huh. so specifically, it's in uh, Mod Podge that always used for like you know acid free. Uh, Mod Podge is the only one. There's a certain Mod Podge. I think it's called. Um, I would basically what I tell my students is basically use um, gel medium, like acrylic gel medium. Or this, the, these blue book, um, this book binder glue. This is a, a neutral pH adhesive. You can use that. Um, the Mod Podge has to be a specific one. There's one, that, somebody told me about that. And again, I have a video online and on YouTube. You can go to my channel and look it up because I, I, I show you many different um, glues that you can use for gluing down your paper to a panel. And then I also have the panels because there's many different panels you can use too. And so um, basically, you just want to glue it down and make it um, the size that you want. Or like I just did here, I just buy it, buy it already glued down. And, you know, depending on how much you can get it for, you know, this, 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 this panel right here, the Crescent panel is not that expensive. It's like for, it's not 22 by 30, it's 20 by 30, unfortunately. Um, but it comes like about, I think, 11, $12 uh, US dollars. I'm not sure what it would be in Canadian. But um, yeah, it's not that expensive. Like, I mean, like specific glue that will be strong enough to with withhold the the cold press, right? Yeah, that would be definitely. I would use um, like I said, most people use gel medium. I think most people like to use the gel medium. It's just it's acrylic gel medium that you buy as a medium basically, and so um. You use that and you put it on the paper and you also you put it on the board and then you just take a big rolling pin or a burnisher and then you just burnish it and then put like a bunch of magazines or books on top of it and just let it sit there and dry and then you're ready to go next time you go do a painting use it you can you can well. weigh it down with you can weigh it down with art books art books are always really heavy yep I mean, yep that's big <laughs> <flat. They are. laughs> good idea that's I mean, what i use but or I if you still to. have encyclopedias from the old days when the people had encyclopedias, <laughs> those work really well too. <laughs> so I'm getting more and more my large areas done of my middle tones. And now I'm basically going to go to my details, my large areas of dark and details. 
and details basically are exactly what they are. They're all the little fine stuff. And usually that's where the hard edges come into effect. Like this umbrella here, I'm not going to make it just black like it is. I'm going to make it make it maybe an orange, I mean, a red black, just something very burgundy. Like, so I, I, I use peach black, but I always put color into my peach black. And so I'm not sure why I'm doing this umbrella right now, but that's okay. <laughs> It's detail time now, and I have all my big, large areas done, and so I'm going in there now with my large areas of dark. And usually that means that you're starting to do hard edges, so everything usually has to be dry by this time. You go in there and start drying stuff up, you know, make sure it's dry, and he'll have, like, a blue shirt on. I can just... And see how I dipped into my gouache here? That's going to cover up better, and I'm still using a wet, like, watercolor, though, and so it will just act like watercolor. Wash can act just like watercolor as any other medium can act like watercolor. You can even make oils act like watercolor. You just have to wet it down. And that's just what it is. Pigment is wetted down. And so just because you're using gouache doesn't mean you have to stop the watercolor look. But I'm just not using it thick. I'm using it thin, like watercolor. But it covers better because it's more finely ground. And so then you're going to get a lot nicer look when it comes to um, keeping it dark because it will not lighten up as much as watercolor will because it's a lot more pigment in there and so I'm putting this person in here right now just because I can regulate my darkest dark because I want him most contrasted and then I go from there and make everything towards him David would, yes. would the binder of the gouache be any different than watercolor the transparent a, yeah there is a little bit of different binder but it's um it still acts the same like the binder in um this um in the gouache i put into a container because it does dry harder than it does with the watercolors watercolors from holbein don't dry they don't dry to a hard clump but their gouache maybe a little bit more so i use these containers these airtight containers and so i put in the gouache there and it has a silicone seal on it. it has these six little things and you open them up and and so that this is a silicone seal and you just put your gouache in there and it'll stay fresh forever too so it's not though you want to keep it like the watercolor whole bind watercolor is fine to keep open like that but this with the gouache it must have a different binder it doesn't have whatever they use to and the watercolor so it is a little bit different in that aspect but not different when i'm using it it's not when i'm using it it's going to be the same because i'm either using it wet on wet or wet on dry Thank you. So the wet and the wet will always give you a soft edge. I don't care what paint you're using. And I also showed today that you can paint on anything, any surface, really. Um, it's all about the water and pigment ratio. So I painted a painting on a tabletop, um, a plastic tabletop today in class, just because I showed them. It doesn't matter what the thing that you're painting on. You just have to know, is it absorbing or is it sitting on top? I, like I used to do a lot of these scenes on hot press and on um, Bristol board, and that would not soak into the paper very much. So you use it a little bit differently because you're going to get a lot of hard edges. But adding your paint into the wash of water is still the same. It doesn't matter if you're working on this or if you're working on something really hard edged or whatever. Hope that makes sense. It's It's kind of funny because... You know, we always worry about what we're working on. And a lot of times good paper is easier to work on, but you can pretty much work on anything. I, I've put a lot of um, gesso on some panels lately where I don't use paper. I just use um, gesso and then I put uh, marble dust into the gesso and the marble dust acts as an absorbent. It absorbs the watercolor. It makes it like a, make it like a piece of paper. Is that similar to the watercolor ground that you can buy? Yeah, that's like um, golden watercolor absorbent ground. Mm -hmm. You can buy the absorbent mm -hmm. ground from golden. I don't right. hope I doesn't make an absorbent ground yet, but mm -hmm. um, you can just add, you can get, uh, what do you call it? Like I said, marble dust and just throw it mm -hmm. in there into your gesso and cover a panel, any panel. panel. Uh, of course, you you know, like I did it on a piece of cardboard. I did it on... Um, the backing of the of the pad of paper that you had, the backing. I just put some gesso on there, with and put a little absorbent ground on there, and it's all good. It's all good. Q O R also makes a watercolor ground. 
and so does Daniel Smith. I think they make a, a watercolor ground, which I don't like very much because it's too it's too grainy. I don't like their ground so much. But all, it all depends on what you like and try it all. And so since he's blue, I want to give this car the same color, just so I have that color somewhere else, like a shirt. So I'll make this Jeep right here. And again, this is the part now I'm going into a little bit more detail because I'm I got my big parts done. And so I'm now taking my bigger parts of the dark or the smaller ones that are more detailed and just starting going in here now and getting those accomplished and done. And usually on cars, it's usually the color of the car is one value and then the windows are either either all dark or all light. And so on this one, it looks like they're more, more they're, I think it's more dark inside the window here. And so I will just get the darks in there. And I know a lot of... Um, it's funny because as a guy, I've always done car, I've drawn cars forever, but in my classes, a lot of the ladies don't like doing cars. Um, they just, they're like little boxes. And so they always give them to me to finish up because I, I used to draw when I was a little kid, I used to draw cars, like race cars. And so it's maybe that's the kind of thing. They are very square. I always think of them as little um, boxes. And so there's a top part that's light and the hood is light, and then the side is a little bit darker, and then the underneath is really, really dark. And then also make it, maybe make them a color so that they stand out a little bit, the car itself. And if you want, like this is actually a Jeep, so this is um, a specific look. And so, you know, if, if, if a Jeep owner is going to buy this, you make sure it's, it has that look. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going real quickly. Just I'm. These are just more of a um, impression of a car. It's not like I'm getting so so detailed that you see exactly what's going on there. It's just basically an impression of what's that, in that area. Here's two people. Little I do these these bobs blobs in my newsletter this week. I, I show you a little video on on YouTube how I do these blobs. Basically, I just put in the. Uh, the torso and then after the torso their legs and then the, a little bit of the head and then i kind of figure out what they're doing i kind of look at them and say okay what are they doing do they have a bike by them do they have a backpack on what is it about them that's a little bit different for the next person here and so then this is um again i know i'm going pretty small but it, it might as well get it done you know i have to get it done sooner or later so i can just kind of go around and when i get to that spot just put in the darker light that it, that's right there for that area. Because now it's detailed. Like I said, I did all the big washes that go around everything. And so I'm just kind of going in here now and getting my my large darks, my detailed darks. That was step three. And I'm going to take my big brush because this, this building right here is really dark, right? And so um, I'm going to go in there with some gouache. I'm just going to kind of go down here. This is dark. And you notice I go across all the, even the beams and stuff. I don't care about the beams so much right there. What I'll do is I'll take my brush now, wipe it on my towel. I always work on a towel. I save a lot of um, having to buy a lot of paper towel. And they, I go to Goodwill and I just get all these white towels and I put it down on, on my thing. So I can always wipe my brush anywhere around here, all around my paintings. I can just wipe my brush and I can just pull out these little lines. Or I can pull them out later while it's dry. And I can put the darker lines in there too. And so I just keep on going down, getting my buildings, the big areas of my building now, because there are some more darks in there now. And so I did this side of this building is a little bit darker too. And I had to wait for that to dry so that I could do this now, because I want hard edges. On the outside, I want hard edges. On the inside, I'm going to keep it soft edged, right? And here is I can float pigment. And I can even do this where um, I see that some of these buildings are lit up a little bit so i'm going to put a little light in here and i'm taking orange actually can you imagine that i'm taking a light color on top of a dark color and you can do that if you keep it wet and do wet in the wet don't do this on dry it has to be wet when you're putting a light color on top of a dark color because you're floating the pigment on top of there and you can even use white you can even use white because white gives you a really cool look when you um add it to a a layer of wet wash it just gives you those little fingers, those little um, watercolor fingers, I call them. And so, you know, I can go re I can go as detailed as I want. And it's just, I do this, these demonstrations, I 
only give myself a certain amount of time. And so it's going to be a lot looser than if I were working in my studio where I give myself a little bit more time. And so that's the only thing difference from when I work in my studio. I'd probably work a little bit tighter, a little bit more. Um, it wouldn't be as loose because I'm probably getting a little bit slower. I'm not rushing through it. And actually, what time is it? What what time are we ending? Um, time to end. Nine, is that it? Yeah, nine. Nine, thank you. Okay. So you have an hour and 10 minutes. That's a lot of time for me. I'm going to definitely have a lot. Of, we're getting a lot of detail in that time. <laughs> like I said, I do every every Thursday, I do a one hour study. And even on Saturday morning, I do a one hour study. And so you'll see that it becomes very, very loose and very, very, um, because I go fast. I'm trying to just indicate the big parts I want to get done. But you notice how I work big areas and I can just turn on. And also you're going to see, I'm going to later on, I'm gonna, I am going to put in some opaque um, lights in here. I will just use white paint and just let some of it be thick, like almost like a oil painting where I'll go in there with a really thick paint and make it look just like, like an oil painting where I'll go in and make it thick. Now there's certain watercolor societies you can't use that in, but most of the big ones, like this year I got accepted in AWS, American Watercolor Society. And um, I did it with, on black paper with um, a lot of gouache because it had to be white on black paper. And it worked out well, and it worked out fine. And um, they liked it. And so I guess I said, okay, for that society. Over here, I'm going to make this dark again, too. Don't be afraid of working large areas wet into wet. Later on, you can go get all the little stuff. Try to get the big stuff first before you go in there and get the small stuff. And you can make this, depending on what kind of colors you like, I always say that you don't have to make everything gray like this. Though this is pretty gray right now, if you think about it. But cities are pretty gray. You know, there, there's not much color in them. And so, but for a scene like this, it's rainy. It's a rainy scene. And usually rainy scenes are pretty much gray anyways. It's a gray day, right? And so you're going to get a lot of grays. And so if you add a little bit of color to those grays, that's cool. And you notice how I'm jumping all over the place, which I normally try to finish an area. But um, I'm having fun with when I have one color in my brush, I just try to use it everywhere. And look at how this brush, I said, my classes today, if I were ever stuck on an island and I was stranded on an island, I wanted to have this brush with me because this brush can do anything and everything. I could finish this whole painting with this one brush because it's really sharp. Look at how, if I turn it sideways, look how sharp that gets. And so that's really thin and I can do all my little thin lines with this brush. So this brush would be the one I, if I'm stranded on an island, this would come with me. So it's just... Questions, please come on. We get we can get some questions. You're explaining yourself so well, <laughs> uh, David. Right. When you're out doing plein air painting, what uh, palette do you use? Do you use a smaller palette? Um, yeah, I actually have a palette that's aluminum. Uh, I have this aluminum palette that I, I kind of want to make this palette for everybody because it, I hate these palettes. These palettes you can't switch these colors around and. You know, it's just, it's too big. I don't like this such a big thing outside. And I use those lip balm things and I don't have it right here. Otherwise I'd show you. No, I don't have it right here at the moment, but I have these lip balm and I and they have lids on them. You can put lids on them if you want. And then you can move your colors all around and I put magnets on them. And so it's a tin, it's a, a basically a tin, not aluminum, it's tin, it's a tin case. And then I just go in and I, and I just, um, it's small enough and I can put it in my palette on my um poche box. I have a little poche box that I use. Okay, thank you. If I spot it, I think I have, it's around here somewhere. My studio is a mess right now. I'm doing a lot of commissions lately and I do a lot of I do a lot of work. Um and it's really weird because I do a lot of work for a gallery in Dallas and we supply a lot of um hotels, large um, fancy hotels with artwork for their for big artwork but most of the stuff I do is abstract and so I do a lot of abstract also so um, abstract is kind of fun and actually I can tell you right now that I probably sell more abstract than I do my original this type of stuff though the city scenes sell pretty well too 
but um, abstracts, people like abstract, good abstract. You gotta still make it, you know, look decent and not just, you know, a dot in the middle of a circle white thing or something. You know, you gotta have some nice niceness to it. Nice design and so like that. So I don't mind um, abstract at all. And I know there's some people that just like to do, you know, representational art, which is fine. You do what you do. I'm going in here now and getting details. What's the name of your brush? Um, it's a Becker art brush. It's called a Holbein Golds. They're Holbein Golds, but I sell a, a set of six. Um, these six right here. These six right here. I sell on my line for sixty dollars, and they're um, they're Becker art brushes, but they're actually Holbein Gold brushes. They just happen to have my name on it, Becker Art. But um, yeah, these are the only six brushes I ever use. These six right here, and you can go online. Um, I know. Oh, I actually you probably can't because you're in Canada. Oh shoot. Forgot, forgot about that. Well, email me if you actually wanted to get some of them. I can probably get them to you. Are they synthetic or sable? Yeah, they're synthetic. They're synthetic nylons. And for the price, it's $60 for the six of them. It's a really good price for a pretty decent brush. And I must say that everybody likes them. They're, they're just not so expensive, but they come to a super fine point. Every one of these brushes comes to like a super fine point and they spring back. If you don't like brushes that spring back, then you don't want this one because they spring right back. They're not like the um, other brushes that are um, more the, like the mop brush where you push it down and it doesn't spring back to a straight point, which some people like that. So it's all up to you what you kind of like. And I like it to spring back to where it comes to straight down position. So as I bend it like this, it comes right back. You know, it doesn't doesn't stay sideways. Mm -hmm. I just, I don't like that at all. <laughs> it does that. Yeah, they look really great. Holbein had bought that company. They used to be Stratford and York. And then Holbein bought the company and made, now made the brushes, named them the Holbein Golds. They used to be Stratford and York though, the, the brushes themselves. So I just decided to make that building a little bit warmer. I'm gonna make this one a little bit cooler. And again, that's just because I don't want it to be, I want it to be part of the the dark part and not the light part, because the light part is supposed to be right down the middle. And then these are a little bit darker. And they can this has more of a mirrored image to it. So you have to realize too, sometimes these buildings are mirrored because they're the glass is like kind of mirrored like. So this one right here, I could actually take and put a little bit of like a like this building is right there, and it can be like it's mirrored right into the into the into the into the building because it's basically showing like a mirror and so i'm just gonna put that right in there and later on i'll put the little lines for the windows and i'll put that in later it's always from bigger and get smaller and smaller and smaller and so now we're gonna get i'm just gonna put some people walking on this side here and it looks like let me just put it make the image bigger just for a second so you guys can see what this image is so see how it's um so there's people on the left there. There's another person walking right here. Okay, and there's a car coming out there. So just so you can see what it, what's going on there. Put that back. And um one second, one second. I just want to see. I also want it on my screen here. I just gonna that way I can see a little bit more. All right, so I'm gonna do the Canadian flag right here, which all my relatives. I don't have any relatives in the United States. All my relatives are in Canada and Ottawa, so I travel up to Ottawa quite often, and um, love that city. Love Ottawa, and then I have um, other aunts and uncles who are have cabins up there and near Shawville and up in the Quebec province. And um, I love going up there in the summer. <laughs> Let me do a fake maple leaf here. And so since we have that red there, we're gonna reflect it into the street because we gotta have, have that color somewhere else. So down here we reflect, right? So you just throw it down into the water down here, into the street. I'm gonna reflect it into the umbrella here. 
because that's what you do. You basically, when you use a color somewhere, you got to use it somewhere else. And so take it, put it somewhere else so that it matches your, your painting. You don't want a color that's so obviously different, unless it's part of your center of interest where you want your eye to go. But other than that, try to incorporate all the colors throughout the entire painting so they all work together. Now I'm getting very, very detailed with little things like telephone poles and and that just takes a steady hand. And here's a little lamp. Here's a street lamp. And I have to wait for this tower to dry and make this back there, but I'm gonna make that as a tint. I'm just gonna go in there with a tint of color. I'll take some lavender. And actually I gotta wipe off a little bit of my palette here, one second. But once in a while, I do have to use some paper towel just to wipe off my palette. Get a little area. Oopsie. So I'm going to go in there. See, I use a lavender. Lavender has white in it. But if you're using it very thin and wet into wet, you're fine. It won't look opaque. And see how fast I'm doing this? If I'm doing this in my studio, I'm probably going a little bit slower. And making these lines in, but I think I kind of like that look of um of like looseness. Anyways, it's kind of fun having it a little bit looser than what it actually is in the photo. I'm not so much of a hyper realist because I like the look of a watercolor to look like a watercolor and not a photograph. And that's all. That's up to you. There's a lot of different people who like different things, and that's all good. Now a little bit darker on the tower. And that's a little bit too dark. I don't want to make it too light. I don't want it to pop out. I still want it to be way back there. But I do want to give it a little bit of detail because it's kind of like part of the center of interest, like shows that it is maybe a um, Toronto and a landmark. And the telephone or the flagpoles. And the more detail you get, the more it looks realistic, right? The more the more they put in here now, it gets more and more realistic as you're going along. And back here, I'm gonna start putting in I think there's a person back there. And so I'll just give him like a little bit of a color for his for his chest or for and his legs. And then right away, put reflections into the into the ground from where they're standing, because there will be reflections into the ground. Anything that you do now that's dark and hard edged is going to be identifying something. So I'm in a stage where I'm identifying things like, is it a person? Is it a car? Is it the building? Something when you're doing your darks and they're hard edged. They are something, they are an object. And so keep that in mind so that you make it look like whatever it is that you're painting. And then right away, since it is a wet street, you just, you again, go right into the, into the street and reflect it. Like this could reflect right there. And, and it doesn't have to be so noticeable and so detailed that you can see exactly what it is. As long as you're close to what it is on top, you're fine. Here's the, here's the little lines in the street. Now he's a little bit darker. Um, since he dried now, I can go in here and kind of make him the center of interest. He basically is a center of interest. And so I'm just gonna give him a little dark underneath his umbrella. And then there's a little part on the umbrella, the little dot right there. I mean, you can get as detailed as you want. You, you can go really detailed. You can go less detailed. There's a bunch of cars on the street right here. So like I said, I usually do the wind, windshield first. I make that dark and just basically take black and I go inside with a really dark, dark. You know, a lot of these were middle tones. They weren't really black or really, really dark. I still have a lot, of, I have a long way to go when I wanted to make it look like it's really, 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 really dark. Like when you're using black, like really in a photograph, this is all, oh, this is black. I don't have to go that quite that far, but I, I, I have the capability of going farther. That's a nice thing. You don't have to go all the way there to black, but 
you have the option. And start getting look real and real as all these things that you put in, like these windows and some people just like to put a little swipe across it. I like to put the little, little dashes to make it look like windows. I'm going pretty fast. Here, I'm just going to swipe it. It's going to make it a little bit darker right here. And some people even use a straight edge to get some of their paint, which is fine. If you if that's what you wanted to make it with a straight edge, that's okay. Go right ahead. There's no problem with that. Here, there's some windows here. And I'm going to use my rectangular brush for windows. If you're doing a rectangular window, use a rectangle, a flat brush because it's one brush stroke where a round brush doesn't do that. So here I'm just doing these rectangular windows. Use a flat brush. You can use it sideways to make it um, like a thin brush. And then you can just dot it. Anybody there? Oh yeah. <laughs> are, we, are we still on? <laughs> Mesmerized. <laughs> I'm going to go back in here, and there's a bunch of buildings back here, all kinds of stuff happening back there, no windows. A good way of doing a car is just doing underneath um, tires underneath a box, like these little, little, little tires. You just put little dots, and then you put underneath the, the tire, you put it really dark. Like here, the tire will be black, because tires are usually black. I've never seen any other color of your tire yet. And they're coming to that, I'm sure. But most tires are black, right? And so that's a very simple thing to use is just use black. And I'm going to put a little dark underneath there. Now, there's hubcaps and stuff like that, but that's that's too much. I'm not going to worry about that. And then, of course, there's the headlights and stuff like that. We're going to put all that. We're going to put all the little specks of light. I didn't use masking fluid. I don't like masking fluid because it gets too harsh. So if you use it right, and if you use a right good paper, you can use masking fluid to get your lights back. And I'm just going to use white paint. You're going to see everything just going to brighten up. And you're going to get a lot of reflections over everything, which will be fun. Uh, I really enjoy that look of things popping out. Like right now, I'm using really dark colors to get them popping, to get the darks popping. But then I'll get the lights popping, too. And we have to pick a Jeep. It's a, spe a special kind of look <laughs> when you're doing the Jeep. <laughs> and a lot of times, I, if I wanted to be really thick, uh, dark, uh, I even use gouache. Like I'm using right now, I'm using gouache because I know that will cover up anything because it's going to cover up. It's more of a cover up because it's more opaque. Mm. Transparent watercolor is not is not um it's transparent, so you're gonna see through it. Where gouache, you're not gonna see through it. You're gonna it's, it's gonna go right through. It's gonna cover up anything you want to cover up. And I'm gonna use my round rigger brush to get some thin lines. And um, if you have Dollar Trees up there, a Dollar Tree, the Dollar Store, we have these things I got for a dollar twenty five. It's a great little straight edge, and I can use it. Like I can go here, and I can just take my brush and just put it down. It's a metal straight edge, dollar twenty-five at Dollar Tree. I forget if you guys have Dollar Tree. Yeah, I think there are some. Yes, we do. And so I just go in there, and I just kind of use that, and I just use the edge of it. I keep it up a little bit, so I just I don't put it all the way down on that paper. I just put it like close to there, and I just take my brush. And run it across there to get a real nice straight edge. Though I rarely use that, but like I said, it's sometimes people like it really, really tight, and that's fine. Then you just use a straight edge. I also use fine line painting pens, and I don't know if I have one right here. Uh, this is a fine line painting pen. It's it's a little thing that you use. You you can put masking fluid in here. You can put paint in here. And what you can do is you can get really solid lines, straight lines. And basically, it has a, you take this 
thing off of here and see this little point on there that cleans it up so that it's a really fine little point and you can clean up through there with a little bit of a needle that goes back into the handle if you if you if you don't clean it really well but basically what is this for you take your paint and you and you scrub it in there you put it right down like this let's say i want to make a black line just put that in there just take my wet brush i test it out a little bit it can't be too thick and it can't be too watery. So it's just like you kind of test it and figure it out. Put more pigment in there. And then I usually put it on my paper towel or my towel. Okay, so now I can do little lines. I can take this little line thing here and I can just That is really cool. Makes a really straight line. And it's actually too wet because it's pouring out little dots. But see I can you know, I can just go in here and make all these little. It's like you're drawing with a pen, basically. Yeah, it's it kind of like a ruling line. pen, like a ruling pen, but it holds more paint. Yeah, the ruling pens. I always had a hard time with this thing, where it's great and it works for a long time. Like I can go in here, and I can just go, and it's nice because you don't have to put a dime underneath your ruler or anything. You just kind of go in there and. Where and, did you get it? Yes, um, Amazon. <laughs> oh, it's called Amazon. a fine line painting pen. Go to my website where it says um products and stuff now here i'm i'm getting it too thick but see how thin a line you can make <laughs> you can and you just keep on drawing them and love it now i gotta go on and do all these now <laughs> started it so now i gotta keep on going <laughs> but look at how many times i went with that and this is i still haven't filled it up so you can just keep on going keep on going and just make lines and you know It's called a fine line painting pen. I know it's a long word, but <laughs> they, I wish they would have made it something shorter or something different, but that's what it's called. Then go down here. And with anything, you know, all our all us artists, we get all these instruments and all these brushes and paints and stuff, and nothing comes with instructions, right? So you basically just have to practice with them, try things with them and 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 work with them before you do them on a painting. Like, don't just start using them on a painting. Use them on something, you know, test them out first. Figure it out before you start going in there and trying to use these things. You can get them on Amazon from anywhere from $16.59 to $25.89. There you go. Thanks. Well, actually, $25.89 looks like it's three pieces. There's also different sizes for oh. them. The, the, there's like this one is a 0 0.05 and they make a 0 or 0.25 and a 0.04 or something like that so you have to look at the size of the hole that is coming out so they make different mm -hmm. sizes so you just have to figure out what size you like and some of them are sold tw two of them at two different sizes and mm -hmm. it all depends on what you want i use a, use a 0 0.7 i think i think i use a 0 0.07 and i think that's pretty nice I have a really, really fine one. It's a little bit smaller than that. That works out really good too. So I guess it all depends on what kind of line you're doing. But I liked my rigger. My rigger, like I'm making the lines. I pretty much use my rigger mostly for lines. I put a little grade into the into the street. And get all this little stuff happening in the street. You know, and really, I it's not as dark as I normally work. But I can just go in here afterwards and and anytime you're doing reflections, this is like you're doing a lake. Um, wet streets, anything that's shiny, anything that is shiny is like doing anything that you're doing like a lake or something because what it's showing is that it's wet and it's reflecting what's above it. And it's not wavy because it's flat, but sometimes the wind comes up and it does look ripply depending on how much water you have on the street. But it's basically you're using it like it's like it's you're doing a lake. It just has we don't have any boats in here. We have cars instead. And now I'm getting kind of detailed and with a bunch of this little detail. Little, here's the red car. We'll put that into the street a little bit. Here are these people. Put them in there. There's a bunch of signs, I'm sure, everywhere. You know, and you just, 
in that point is basically you're trying to make this look bright because that's a light area and these dark areas you want to make dark because they're dark areas now look at i'm in there when i put that wet into wet look at how that little it looks like little lights on in the building so it's stuff like that is really cool i really enjoy stuff like that when you're working wet into wet and just putting thick paint in there it's okay and then like this umbrella got a little bit too flat and so i'm just going to rub out like on the top here a little bit i'm just going to pull out and that's one thing about the Stonehenge aqua paper. You can rub out a little easily by just rubbing a little bit. And so then you get that look of like that it's wet because an umbrella wouldn't just be solid. If there's water on it, it's going to, again, reflect what's above it. And it's also give you the same color from what's above it. So by putting a little bit of blue on top of that will show that it's reflecting the sky and that it's wet because it's like a mirror, basically. So I can put a little bit of that in, in, in the umbrella. And that's my Jeep is not really quite red on the hood. And I'm using kind of thick paint for that. And so basically what I'm going to do now is go in there, get a few more people in here, and I'm going to use my white paint, and I'm going to wax it for you. And I think we still have enough time, right? Yep. You're good. So I'm going to put some people over here. I think there's some people standing right on the edge here. So I'm gonna put a blob. I call these bobs blobs. And so I'll take my round small brush and I'll get I'll do the torso first. And so I'm just gonna I'm not gonna draw them out because they're not that important. Like these people are not important that you have to draw them out. This guy is. I want to make that guy look exactly like he is in the picture. But these people over here, I'm just gonna line up their heads. You notice how all their heads are the same um length right here? See how their heads are all the same? It's a horizon line. And so no matter how far forward they are or how far away they are. Their, line, their heads will line up if they're all the same, about the same size people. So I'm going to go right here. This is going to be the heads is. So the body's going to be, no matter how long I do it, as long as his head is right there, it's going to look like it's in, in line with the, with proportion wise, it'll look good. Their heads have to line up. That's one of those little, little tricks you want to do. If you ever need to um, put a people into your paintings, just line up the heads. If it's on a flat surface, of course, if you're on a mountain and it's going up and down, that's a little bit different story. But, or if you're also the person who's taking the picture is up above and looking down, that's a little bit different too. But normally it's pretty close to like, if it, like the street, city scenes like this, it's all the heads are lined up. And there's some, this, this lady is going to be waving to their friend down the street. Hey, here we are. We're ready to go to, ready to go to the, Financial district. Is that what you said? The financial district? <laughs> and so, um, put that in there. Like, yes, hey. it is. Yes. <laughs> I was like making up stories when I'm painting. It's like, oh, there's, there's so and so. He's right there. And they're going to the, they're going to the opera around the corner, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. The opera house is there. <laughs> is there really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was just a guess. <laughs> and that, that yellow part there, that, that looks like construction. Yeah, what? that area, yeah. Like construction panel. That's another thing you're gonna get. I just, um, if you ever wanna find some really neat, um, I've just been on TikTok lately and what I, there are people who now, what, what they do is they just walk around the city. Uh, like I, one person I just saw today was walking around New York City and they just keep their camera on, their, their video camera and they just walk. And boy, I've been getting some great scenes. Because so what I do is I swipe my phone then. I just take my phone and I'll, I'll be like this. And I'll be watching them. And they'll be walking through the city. And I'll just go like this. I'll just swipe my hand across the an Android phone. And it takes a screenshot. And so I've been getting some great shots of city scenes of these people just walking through the city of New York. And so I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. Nice. And then I found another person who was in um, France, in Paris. And they were just walking the streets of Paris. So I, I think I because I... When you do one thing on on like these Instagram, these social media things, next thing you know, you're getting a hundred of them, right? And so now I've got all these people walking around all these cities and I'm just taking tons of shots of from them <laughs> because they're just walking and I just swipe and I do one, two, three, four, and I just keep on going and trying to get some nice shots. And I've got some really, really nice shots lately. Hmm. And this shot I get from, I'm not sure if you know, um, there's a lot of uh, websites out there now that have... Um, um, royalty free images and so these images are royalty free and one place i go to is unsplash u-n-s-p-l-a-s-h 
unsplash.com. There's Pexels, P-E-X-E-L-S.com. And these are all places where you can, photographers let you use their imagery. So you go there, and that's what this came from. And I just typed in Toronto, and um, a bunch of a bunch of scenes from Toronto came up. And so I just picked this one because I like this a rainy scene. I like it because it was rainy. And you don't have to um, even let the, pers- the photographer know that you're using it. You can thank them to use it, or you can tell them what you're using it for, but you don't have to. But for classes and for practicing, it's an awesome thing, especially for my classes, because I, I can't always get enough pictures because I I need a lot of pictures during the week just because I do so many um, classes. I I, I can't every Thursday I do a um, a class online. And so I need a new picture every week and I need one that other people can do too. I don't want to be too hard for everybody. So it's, if it's for you or or for it to sell, it has to be use your own uh, resources. Um, No, you can, you can use it for anything. It's um, like, really free, so you can um, take it, use it, and sell it. It's up. They're not going to come after you because it's royalty free. The imagery is for royalty free. Like I can use this image any way I want. I can um, sell it now. I can print it. I can make prints of it. So this is like from the internet, or yeah, like I like I saying from the internet from the um, pexels.com. Go to one of those sites like pexels.com, unsplash.com. They all have um, these royalty free images now where photographers let you use their imagery for nothing, you know, for free. There are some, like, it's stock photography, basically, but it's probably not their best imagery. So, you know, you're not going to probably get the best of what they do, but, you know, hey, for for learning purposes and for doing it, it's, it's great. Hmm. I use it all the time because I have to. I, I couldn't do my classes without uh, those guys. So I thank them a lot. I'll put down the name of the, our, the photographer and... And they're all fine with it. I mean, it basically, you can actually use the photograph in artwork. I mean, or just use the actual photograph. Like if you're doing an ad or something and um, they want to hopefully that agencies use it and they want to actually use them again, basically is what I think they're trying to do. All right. The very last thing I'm going to do now is like you paint. just, you can just use those uh, like any like photos from any artist and then just uh, reinterpret it yourself and then just sell it, is it? Or just have to, still have to use the, your own resources? Um, ask that again, I'm sorry. Like, let's just say, for example, if you use uh, one of those uh, like photography artists mm-hmm. and then just reinterpret it yourself, it's just like, a, yeah. it's still- You can use it whatever you want. You can use it for any way you want. You can. You can manipulate it, the photo. You can do whatever you want with the photo. The photo is royalty free, so you don't have to worry about it being um, registered trait or anything like that. It's it's they want you to use it for whatever you want to use it for. Hmm. Uh, I know some right, societies or uh, groups don't allow you to put it in a juror show. Um, does the Toronto Watercolor Society, Margaret? You could probably answer that if it's um, you know a picture that's not your own. And you put it in a juror show. Yeah, read their perspectives really well because that's that's right. Because there are a lot of them that will do that, where you have to use your own photograph. For most of be- our uh, shows yes. in Canada group and for TWS, you need to use a photo that you have taken. Um, to my knowledge, we don't even allow with permission. Uh, I know you have to read each group's rules specifically, but. Um, for us, it needs to be your own composition and original uh, shot. Yeah, that's why so I thought. We cannot use, we we should not be going on to these sites, copying the photo and entering it in our shows. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, so then, um, like I said, I use it mostly for teaching purposes, which is really great. But in any way, you shouldn't be using anything that you do in class anyways, in any of those shows either. Don't ever no. use your work that you do in a class in a show. That's not, that's not, that's not allowed either. That's right. But for, but for using, you know, to learn from, you know, go ahead because there's some really great shots. And actually you learn a lot when you use your own imagery anyways, because then you know what to take and shoot what you're shooting and stuff. So it's nice to do that. I, I had a job as an illustrator, so 
I can pretty much paint the scene from out looking at anything. Um, that's what I did for 35 years as an illustrator, a storyboard illustrator. I worked for an advertising agency and I did all, all my drawing was from my imagination. So I could do this scene from nothing, you know, for just kind of make it up. And, um, but if you have a photograph that it makes it that much more easier, but that's what I did for the 35 years. I had to make everything up because that's my job. That was my job to art trader would come to me and say, you know, do a lady drinking a, um, a Coors Light or a, um, a Miller Light and have them in a bar or this and that. And so I would have to do that. I would just, I couldn't have time to go there and, and set something up. I just have to do it from your imagination. And so that I actually, I'm writing a book right now that's going to teach you how to work from your imagination and not so much using always um, even, even the actual subject matter. And so you just make things up, you know, you just make it up and look at it. So how many of you know what an elephant looks like? You know what an elephant looks like right when you see one? So could you just draw an elephant right now just from, from your imagination? You should, because that's how I learned later on, because I took four years of life drawing and I couldn't do that. And I was really mad at my school, American Academy of Art, because my first job was to be able to draw from my imagination. And I couldn't do it. And I took four years of life drawing every day for four years. I took life drawing. And uh, when I got out and I couldn't do this job, I'm like, wow, I'm really mad at this place because I couldn't do my job. And so I learned how to do that by just, you, you memorize, you memorize objects. And I, I mean, I know, you know, what things are like a horse is a horse, you know, but do you know how to draw one without having to look at the horse, you know, but do you have, what you do in your head, you picture the big parts of it and then you can kind of get close. And the more and more you practice this, the more you start realizing what's important when you do look at something, because then you start picking up the big picture of things and not so much all the little small details. And that's how you start looking at things and at the big picture. And so now let's get some red here. And I think I'm almost done here, guys. And I'm just going to, um, I'm going to show you how to, how to um, wax it. Uh, we'll have to dry it before I wax it. I put the little red in the street. Beautiful. You've done a great job. What's that? It's beautiful. You've done a great job. Oh, well, thank you. So, David, uh, no, sorry, David. I'm just, you just mentioned that uh, the Holbein paint, watercolor paints don't dry in your mm -hmm. palette. Is that, I'm not familiar with that. Is there a reason for that? Why? They don't use Oxcall. They don't use Oxcall in their paints. So Oxcall is what gives it like a lot when you're putting paint into your palette and all of a sudden it dries to a hard rock because you left it open. Well, it doesn't do that. It doesn't oh. dry to a hard rock ever. It just stays instantly rejuvenates, instantly rejuvenates. Now the, the gouache does dry a little bit harder, though I just keep it wet and I close it up with that thing and then it's airtight. So that's okay with that. But these, I don't do anything to you can tell these, this palette, is very old, <laughs> and so, and um, and the paints in there, I just scoop out and put it into the next palette because they always like this one right here is dry right now, but I can just put a little bit of water on there, and it will instantly rejuvenate, and it's going to be thick. See how that's alizarin crimson? Look at how how instantly it comes back, and you get a lot of pigment. See how much pigment I can get in there? Okay, thank you. So, so they, they, yeah, use, they don't use they use the gum. Do they use the gum arabic? I don't know what they use actually. Oh, okay. I'm, not, I'm not sure what they use for their binder, but I think Oxcall was only used anyways for the fact that they want to make it more transparent. And so it's not, it, um, but that's not, you know, to me, I make my things transparent because I use less of pigment and more paint or more water is how mm -hmm. I make things more transparent. But I guess other companies put that in there still to make their paints more transparent. Um, I find them to be very transparent, the, the watercolors. So I'm not sure, you know, why, well, I, I, I had asked them one time, well, why don't the other companies take it out? Why don't they use, um, Oxcall anymore? Why don't they just leave it? Cause the, the, the pigment is ground so fine that you really don't need that. But they say it's because they sell more paint then <laughs> because it dries out. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're, I guess the other companies are smarter because they get more money then because you dry out your paints. All right, and so there we have that. I think Core, I'm not quite sure if Core has um, Oxcall in it, the golden paints. 
All right, let me, I'm gonna really quickly put um, a heater on this just so I can heat it really quickly and get it dry, which I normally don't do. I don't like to dry with a, with a and actually I'm using a, a, a Wagner stripper, but I'm not gonna do it really hot. I'm just gonna put it on and just really quickly dry it so I can put, show you how to put the wax on it. And it's also not quite as loud as a hairdryer. So I just put it on it very close. I'm gonna, there's only a couple of spots that are need to be dried up. And so when you do the, the waxing, make sure that it's totally dry though. You have to make sure it's totally, totally dry. Nancy says here that Da Vinci and American Journey do not use Oxcall. What's that? American um, Journey doesn't use Oxcall? Or Da Vinci. Oh. Oh, wow. I didn't even know that. Learn something new every day. Yep. <laughs> it's fun learning new stuff every day, you know, and it is. And I'm getting really excited. I'm heading down in two weeks. I'm heading to Canuga Water Media Workshops. And it's a mm -hmm. workshop that um, I learned from Linda Kemp. She told me about these workshops. Actually, I took them over for her because Linda had gotten um, um, vertigo and she couldn't do this workshop in North Carolina near Asheville. And it's called Canuga Water Media Workshops. And and she couldn't do it. And she asked me if I could take it over. And so I learned about these Canuga Water Media Workshops. And they are amazing. It's so much fun. You get 200 artists, maybe 250 artists, 10 teachers. And you spend four days. It used to be five days, but now it's four days. You spend um, all day for four days with them. And they have all the food you can eat. <laughs> it's like... It's just amazing. It's a really fun workshop. And they have in the evening, they always have like somebody demonstrating or giving a talk. So there's a show in the in the evening every evening. And it's really a lot of fun. It's called Water Canuga Water Media Workshops. And now Cheap Joe runs them, runs the um the workshop. And um and it's a super, super fun place to um go to. David, did you go to the Eric Rhodes Watercolor Week? That was it. Yeah, I did. A, I did actually. I did a little um, video on one of them. I don't know if you remember. Um, I only had about fifteen minute, like a, I think a fifteen minute uh, window. I was doing a little thing for Legion Papers. I was just showing a little video. Uh, but yeah, and I'm also going to the um, Smoky Mountains Plain Air Fest this year again. It was in Colorado last year, but I'm going to go oh, to right. the, yes. Mm -hmm. So that's the Eric Rhodes one. That so they're going there this year. And I'll yeah, be there. That's I'll be, a big event too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually enjoyed it last year. Last year I went on my own just to go to see it and see what it is. And this year I'm going with Legion Papers and going to promote their papers. Nice. Joe says cal calcium carbonate is the binder used in gouache. Okay. Thank you. I should know that. <laughs> I'm looking for okay. So what do I use for um, wax? I use this Dorlin wax. It's called Dorlin um, Wax Medium. Um, the company is Jacquard, and um, they make it for oil painters. But you can use this wax. It's cold. It's called cold wax. Um, they're also if you can find something that's called cold wax, it's the same thing. It's kind of like a wax with resin in it. And basically, I use this on top of the watercolor. You got to make sure it's dry. And what I like to do is I like to use a um, little rag. After I get to a certain point with my towels, I then make rags out of them when they're too dirty. Or I get masking fluid or something on them. And so what I do is I take my fingers, and that's another good reason to have um, gloves on. I take it like that. That's just cold wax. And make sure your painting is dry, and then just rub it into the into the board, into the paper. It's not going to do anything to your paper or, or to your paint. You, people think it's wet and it's going to screw everything up. It doesn't do any of that, not nothing at all. It just actually makes it a little bit shiny at first, but it dulls down to more of a matte finish. <laughs> and it kind of gives it a great little, little look. I really like the look of it afterwards. Now, this is protecting it from water then. And also, I'm not going to go all the way down because I got to sign it first. <laughs> mm -hmm. Once you do something, once you put this um, wax on there, you're done. You cannot go back in. I mean, you're done then. And so what you do is you try to um, put it on really thin. You don't need to put it thick like varnish. And the reason you don't want to use varnish is because it yellows in time. 
and this doesn't um, wax does not yellow and so then i take i kind of buff it into the into the thing then i just kind of rub it into the into the paper and i just rub it till it's smooth and I, it's rubbing it into paper until it's all even you don't want it thick you don't want it thick you just want to put it in there like this i would i would i would actually not do it right after your paint because it's probably still a little damp in there a little bit you know, and I, I just, you know, I did it a while ago. And so I would leave it overnight and just wax it in the morning and make sure you did everything you need to do on it too. Because once you put the wax on, you cannot paint anymore on there. You can maybe put oil on top of that, but you can't use watercolor anymore because it basically repels any kind of water whatsoever. And it's um, it's not UV protecting it though. Um, and I'm trying to get um, Holbein. Holbein is going to start making a, a, a cold wax, I think they were saying. I was telling them, make it with something that's UV protected too. I'm not that um, I'm not that worried about UV protection because our watercolors, the glass is just a slight UV protection. When you put glass on it, it's not super UV protection either. When you're putting, though, you can spray varnish or you can do the spray varnish. There is some spray varnish you can put on your watercolors that is UV protected. I don't like to use the varnish though because it yellows in time. I'm thinking. So, um, and I find this to be really easy when you're doing a plain air painting, you just put this on there and you're done. Like this area right now is done. It's, uh, uh, it's all I had to do is rub it on there, rub it in the morning when it dries, it takes about 24 hours to dry. Then you can buff it even to, if you want to put another coat on it, you can actually make it shiny if you'd like, but you don't have to. And then, um, and then after you got it all waxed and you got your name in there and stuff, then you can just take and get yourself because now you did the thing paint to a certain size frame right so you just put the frame right over it and you're all done no glass no nothing you know maybe do it sideways <laughs> so there you have it so you, you, just... you don't worry about having a, a matting at all eh? no but now you don't want matting but you need a large enough size frame um plain air frames are nice because you got this little part right here you know and in a, a plain air frame like this you have a large area that looks like a like a mat. So you mm -hmm. still want a pretty substantial frame. And they're making some really modern frames right now that are really neat for um, oil painters. And so you'll use those because you want it to look like um, more rich. It's a more, it's a richer look by using um, no glass. And galleries do not like paintings that have glass on them. And Very we, true. And us watercolorists did that to ourselves because we saw all these prints and now the prints are so good. I mean, I, I have a printer here in Illinois that you, can, you can't tell the difference between the print and the actual painting. It's that good. I mean, the prints have come out so well. And yeah, they're signed prints, but if a, the average customer doesn't know that, they don't know about what's good or bad. And so they, they go, oh, that one's $50, that one's 300. I'm gonna take the $50 one, you know, cause they're not looking about for an investment or anything like that. They don't care about originality. They're just, the, they're just customers and they go for the cheaper price, right? And so we kind of did that to ourselves. But oil painting, oil painters, you know, they, um, it looks, it just, it looks richer. And basically they can get more money for them. And so that by, I've done that to myself now. And so now this painting, when I used to frame it with a mat, like, so let's say like this is, um, this is 12, what is this? This is four, this is 12 by 16. So this is 12 by 16. I normally would sell like this with mat and everything for about maybe three fifty four hundred dollars. Now I go up almost double that. I go over to seven eight hundred dollars because it's no no glass behind it, and it's just it's a perception perception that is more valuable because it's an original. Where because if you have it behind glass, it looks like a print, right? Because it, it could be a print. You don't know if it's a print or if it's an original anymore. And galleries and the states don't really take watercolors. Uh, there are some, but most of them take oil paintings because it's real estate on the wall. And so they want the most money for the real estate. And so they're not going to put a watercolor when they can put a oil painting up there or a pastel. Now pastel also needs glass, but most pastels use that really expensive glass. That's another thing you can do. You can buy that really expensive glass that you can't even see, you know, the museum quality one, but that's really expensive. I mean, it's the price of some of the paintings, of the glass. So so I've been waxing all mine and I just put them into these really nice frames that are a little bit wider. Now, the, the of course, the frame are going to cost you more. But now you have to also watch for societies like AWS. I um, had gotten in this year and I had sold the painting already and I sold it as a without glass. And it was um, a plein air piece I had done. 
And so I had to re put, I had to put glass back on it so that I can go send it to New York in the AWS show. And so I was like, boy. <laughs> so I think um, so some of the societies have it already where they, you don't have to have glass, but most societies have glass and mat. So that's in a thin frame. So, cause you definitely can't put a thin frame on this. It would look really weird to have a really thin frame with no mat. So that wouldn't look nice unless you're doing something modern and it's very big, then maybe you can put a really thin frame on it. But normally you want a nice big, thick frame on it and something that you don't put a mat on there. Can you show us the uh, back of the frame and how it would um, attach to the painting and how you would hang it? I'm sure. Thanks. So I take it like this. The back of the frame is just, you know, wide open. Normally I would put the glass on there and then I put the mat on there and then I put this, but then I just put it back like this. And then I have a, hold on one second. I got to go get my stapler. Wow. A lot of great presentation. Wow. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And the... So I have a little case here of all my um, framing stuff. And so I have a point driver. And so when I'm out working on, on plein air uh, uh, festivals and they want the painting framed, you know, I used I used to bring the glass with a mat cutter and all that stuff. And when you're, you know, now I make sure I always have my boards to size. So I look at that. It's right to the size of the frame. You're done. You know, and then I take this is a point driver, Logan point driver. And basically they have these little, these little um pin, uh, points, you know, and then you put them in there. It's just like a stapler. You put them in there, mm. shut it, and then just I like to go around the outside like this. And these are flexible. You can buy rigid ones or flexible ones. So if I want to take this out of there, I just bend them back, right? And so it just staples them right into there. This on Amazon is, I think, like $60, $64. But it's a stapler, and they make all different – there's different brands. This one, actually, I live in northern Illinois, and the company, Logan Company, is um, two towns over. And so when this breaks, I take it to them and, I, and this is the third one because they do break and they don't drive something. And I take it to them and say, hey, it's not working. And so they give me a new one because I just walk into the office and say, hey, I've been working with this. And luckily, it's just the company is right down the street, which is really amazing. So that's it. Right. And then I would put uh, my um, I put my wire in there. And. Um, hmm. So I have two of these. I would just put that in there, right? You just put that in there. And I have a little, I have my awl. I just punch holes in there. I have my little screwdriver with my screws. I screw it in. And then I also have my, my roll of wire. I have a roll of wire, put it right in there, and you're done. Right? And that's it. Now, some people, if you want it to be looking really nice, you would put it maybe, before you put this on, you'd put it back in like a dust cover. And you can do that with double-sided tape. You just put it all the way around and then put your tape or your paper over it, maybe black paper. They sell the black paper. And then you just put that on there. You glue that down. I cut the corners, and then I put the wire on top of that. All depends. <laughs> and so much easier, and it's not custom framing. So you can save yourself a lot of money, even though the frame costs more because it's wider. This frame I got from Jerry's Art of Ram. I bought like five of them when they were on sale. And this frame was like 40 bucks. I think it was like close to $40 for this size frame. Now this is 16 by 12 by 16. Mm -hmm. I also bought 16 by 20, 14 by 18. And so always work standard size, you know, or buy, buy panels that are standard size. Mm -hmm. Ampersand makes a panel that's like not paper, but you can do that. But like I said, you yes. can put down the paper on there too. So there it is. Mm -hmm. Right. Any questions? Yeah. Where who who supplies the uh the paper on the aluminum backing? Where um, can, that is Legion that Legion Papers. Legion Papers makes some um, with the aluminum, and they're just coming out with it. They're not in the stores yet. Um, they're just um, NAMTA is a as a um show that all the art suppliers go to, and they're going to New Orleans this year. The same week I am going to Canuga, which I am <laughs> so pissed because last year they're always a week apart. This year, the same week, and I can't go down to NAMTA, which is in New Orleans. And I would have loved to go on there because all the suppliers come out with their new products. 
and Legion was going to be down there this year showing their new supply of aluminum panels. And so I work with the lead. I, I work with Legion to test their products out. And so this is the, like I said, this was the aluminum panel and I tested it out. Now this paper was really bad. Um, as you can tell, it was not, it was something about the paper was really weird. And so they, they knew that. And I told them, I said, you can't sell it like this, but I just, I, like I said, I can work on anything. And so I just, I just made it more rough. I made a more rough thing. Something that was wrong with the sizing or when they pressed the paper, it really ruined the paper when they did that. So, um, I was testing it for them, but this is Legion papers and they're out of New York city. And, um, you can buy them in any art store. It's called Stonehenge Aqua Paper. And you can go to my website again. Go to my website. And um, I'm just going to show that again really quickly. You can see. If you go right to here. And there's my email or my website address. It's either beckerart.net or my name, David R. Becker. Don't forget the R. And then down here is the product. Um, here, you can recommend products. So I press on that. And here are all my brushes. And here are like the Holbein paints. And here are the Legion papers. And there's also all kinds of things here. The, the liners that I talked about, the little liners and this mister, the new misters. Here's marble dust I talked about. You can put marble dust in the gesso. Here's the Dorlin wax. Here's the this is the um, this is the plain air event uh, box I have, the poche box. And here's some transfer paper if you need to transfer your pay, um, your drawing because drawing is my number one thing. I really harp on drawing. And you have to do good drawing and also use an airbrush. This airbrush is compact like that, and I didn't use it tonight, but I didn't really need to. I got a really soft edge, but there are a lot of watercolors who use atomizers or um, uh, airbrushes. And this now, there's a, a thing called Da Vinci Eye that you can you use your camera. You want to go back on so they can see we're here or not? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry? Sorry, oh, I don't think they were talking to you. Oh, Okay. <laughs> So there you can get all that stuff on there and you just click on it and you go, it takes you right to a place you can buy it too. You know, and it just shows you all the things. And so it's easier for me to show this stuff. Let me go back to my table tab. So it takes them. What else could I cover? I think that's about it, right? And we got this framing. <laughs> I kind of ruined this frame, I think, because I was, I've been using this constantly for showing. <laughs> But um, it's so easy. I, I really, and you know, it's, it's, to me, it's a no brainer because if you can get more money on your painting, just because you're not adding glass or a mat, why would you not do that? That to me, it doesn't make sense to do that the other way. And it doesn't matter how big your painting is or how small it is. If you do it, frame it like an oil painting um, and use a wax or a varnish, you can use wax or varnish. And a lot of artists, watercolors are doing that. Um, Brianna Brown, I know, does it. Um, she's down in New York. Um, where's she from? Um, I know that you guys had um, Sarah Yeoman. I, I, has she been doing that? I don't know. Uh, she was I'm at Canuga sorry. last year. Brianna Brown is uh, one of our presenters in um, September, I believe. Yeah, ask her. She uses varnish. I think she varnishes. Yeah, I've seen on her site, she's got little uh, tutorials on how she does that. Yeah. I met her. Uh, I met her, a lot of these people. I met at um, Canuga because all these they have teachers there, and um, and I also met them. And um, Brianna is a big plein air painter, so I met her in at the last um, Eric Rhodes the the convention, the plein air convention. Hmm. But yeah, so she does that too. But what she does, and I don't highly, I don't recommend it. But a lot of artists, what they do first is they put the varnish down first, and then wax on top of that. But the wax has to, I would put the wax down first and then maybe varnish over top of that because the wax is penetrating with your, with the medium. It's with the pigment. It's actually combining with the pigment to make it hard. And so it can't soak in. If you're putting a varnish over that, the wax just floats on top and it's not adhering to something. The wax actually adheres to the pigment and makes it solid. And so it, it brings it into the paper and makes it solid where if you put a varnish on there first to make the UV protection is what they're doing. Um, but then the, it doesn't give the wax any place to stick to. It doesn't give it to, to go into the pigment because basically that's how the varnish works. Or I mean, the, the wax works. It, it combines with the pigment inside. And the, I'm not sure if you know about the um, chalk paint. People use chalk paint for furniture and they wax their furniture instead of um, varnishing it 
for the same reason because they it absorbs into the pigment of the paint and then creates a hardness to the paint hmm. so this will become hard as a rock it becomes like hard as varnish the wax people think of wax is being waxy right no it, it it actually cures to a hard rock and so that you can't do anything anymore you can spill water on there and I actually right now I could put I could put water beads on this side right here and it's just going to bubble it's just going to stay on top because I waxed it already so mm. see yeah, it's just it's bubbling you can't really see it but it's how up. long how long would you let it cure for um, they say a couple of days, but it depends on the atmosphere and what you, where you're at and how dry it is and stuff. But it just takes a couple of days and it cures. And you don't want to put it on thick. That's the problem with most people. They put it on way, way, way too thick. Matter of fact, you don't want to have any thickness to whatever because then it becomes tacky and it will take for it won't it won't cure because you have to have a thin layer. A thin layer is enough. You don't need to make it thick like varnish. You know, people are thinking that they're putting to put it on like varnish and make it really thick. Because that's not the way you want to do it. And I had done that, and the one lady who works with oil, um, cold wax, told me I did it totally wrong. So I had one video. I, I think I took that down because I was telling the people to put it on there wrong. You put it on very, very thin. You try to wipe it all off, and just let the, let it go into the paper and do it very thin. You're not applying it like varnish, where you're letting it be on top of the paper. It becomes part of the paper and the, and the pigment. So that's one thing you do have to remember that you. Very thin layer, very thin layer. That's all you need. And if you, you want to put another one... layer on afterwards, you can though. And I'm it's sorry. a very nice look because I've tried it with a couple of pictures, which I was happy to sell. And they, it, it really, it's a, it's a beautiful look to the end because it, it doesn't change the color, but it somehow yeah. enhances it. It kind of makes it look like an oil painting. It makes it look like it's, an original work of art with the pigment there in front of you, where when you're covering a glass, you don't see that yeah. pigment. Yeah, it's amazing. Would you recommend that we wear gloves when we're putting on the wax? Um, you don't have to. It's actually kind of um good for the skin because it's wax, right? <laughs> you know, it's it's wax, and so <laughs> if you want soft skin, it just it doesn't. It's not dangerous. It's not um chemically. There's no there's resin in there. I think the only thing is there's resin. But I like wearing gloves because then it protects your hand. Yeah, I would do it. I would use gloves. I used to I use cheesecloth. I put it on with cheesecloth. It's a little piece of cheesecloth because there's no yeah. lint. Yeah, that's yeah. a good idea too. Yep. I um, old t-shirts. <laughs> yeah, cheesecloth. Yeah. Yeah. I I I can guarantee you that more and more people are going to be doing this because not only for the fact that it protects it, but that you get more money for your paintings. I mean, how I don't understand why we would not do that. <laughs> and it looks better. It looks better than a piece of glass in front of it. And then you can sell it in the galleries that don't take glass or don't take watercolors. But now you can do a watercolor. And I've used it now. And I what I do is I kind of use my gouache on there too to make it look like it's not a watercolor. But I, I it still looks fine. Like this looks like a watercolor, right? But it's now because I don't have glass or I don't have a mat on there, it just looks makes it look it makes it look richer. For some reason, and like you said too, there's something about it by rubbing it together. It just somehow brings it together or something. I'm not sure what it does. Like I only did the top part here. I didn't do it down here because it's still wet. But um, it all hold things together. It kind of like makes it a matte finish on there. It's a, it's a beautiful effect. Yeah, I'm really hooked yeah. on it. I have a question. You say you can put another layer of wax on top mm -hmm. that makes it more shiny. Yeah, you How can. How long you wait between? Each procedure. Well, each time you each time it would you have to cure. You wanted yeah. to cure because uh -huh. you don't want to put it, and then you just put it on top of that, and you just um. Yeah, yeah, but how long you wait between the first time and the second? Until it's dry, time? until you feel it's dry and it's like no longer wet or tacky. You don't want it to be tacky or wet, and then sometimes take it a night, and sometimes it takes two days, three days. It depends again about the atmosphere that you're in doing this in. I have this wax. Once I use it on something. That somebody took a photo and we say, put wax, it will clear it. I put wax and killed my painting. I have the wax, the same one here. It's cold I, wax? Yeah. It was a watercolor? Was it a watercolor? Because you can't use it on certain things. Like you can't use it on. Acrylic. Um... I'll show you. Exactly. Acrylic? You're getting lots of wonderful comments here in the chat. Well, painting looks gorgeous. Thank you very much, David. Wonderful presentation. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. 
So sounds really good. Everybody's happy. Yeah. That's, that's uh, good. Uh, David, the name of the street is Bay Street. B A Y. <laughs> What's Bay that? Street in the name of the street you've painted? Uh huh. Bay Street in Toronto. Bay. It's like it's like your Wall Street. Yes. It's yes. Bay Street. Bay Street. Yes. You said. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah, the name. Yes, B A Y. Well, this painting is called uh, "Rainy Day on Bay Street." <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Rainy Day on Bay Street. <laughs> David, I have a quick question. Sorry, I have a quick question about uh, gluing the watercolor paper to a, a wood panel. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you uh, recommend um, using a, a gesso on the wood panel first, and then using the acrylic gel medium as the glue? No, no, you don't have to worry about that. That's just gonna put a weird layer on it. I would just put it right into the right into the board. Right. It's, so without the the gesso. Yeah, you don't need gesso on there. Okay. That, that's just gonna give the you a gel layer medium that's isolates it enough, doesn't it? What's that? Like the gel medium isolates it enough. I mean, I've had some people say you should do a coat of PVA because you're just sealing the wood so no stain comes through. But the gel medium does that. Yeah, the gel medium has that quality. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, you don't need to put gesso at first. That'd be like double, you know, you wouldn't have to do that. Yeah, the gel medium protects it because that's the layer of gel medium. Will um, And actually, I think um, most people do that because that's the best way of doing gluing your paper down is a gel medium is what I heard from all the other okay. artists I've been talking to. One last question. Uh, uh, Dave, you have one question there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Back to the board. Uh, because it's a board, does paper weight um, come into it at all? I like to use the um, the, uh, the the thick cold press, the double thick. Three hundred um, pound. Three hundred pound. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The six the six hundred grams per square meter. It kind of waste it. You kind of waste it by buying um, thick paper for um, if you're gluing it, because it's going to be thick once you glue it down. So and it's my kind of. Is um, for, if, my question is for if you're buying the ready-made boards, do they do they sell them in weights or do they just sell them in hot press and cold press? No, it's just it's just hot press and cold press. No weights okay. because it's already weighed. I mean the the I think they use 140 on there. So if you if you don't like that look or if you don't like the feel of 140, you're still going to get that feel because it's going to be 140 paper. But um, Legion paper is the 300 pound and one. 140 are pretty close to the same when you're using them but they're gluing them onto a board and so it's really hard so it's going to be and there's no and impossible to bend it look at this i'm trying to bend it you cannot bend it it's really super now this is pretty small but they're only going to make it the largest are going to make it 16 by 20 which is not very big but they're just starting out with that and just see because this will be kind of expensive actually because you are buying a piece of aluminum so it's going to be more than just a sheet of paper so you got to think of that, but you don't have to do any of the work and, and it's pretty cool. I got a feeling there are going to be artists who are going to cut through this and let some of that um, aluminum show through. I know there's somebody going to do that. They're going to cut out an area and let some of the um, aluminum show through their painting. I can just see that right now. Or if it doesn't work out, like you did in a painting, use the back and glue another piece of paper onto the back. <laughs> True. Thank you. I'm going to switch to Angela. I think she has a few words before we sign off. So I just want to thank David. It was amazing. I mean, I, I'm just like, you know, stuffed with all this information. So um, uh, thank you so much for today. It was really great. It was one of the best presentations we've had. So uh, I just, thank you. Uh, unless right. anybody has any last questions. Some questions about how do you sign up for your classes on Thursday? And there's no sign up. You just sign on to YouTube. It's all free. Um, you do any, and it stays up there forever. So the 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 um the videos are up there forever. So you can go back to ones that you like or and every everything, and you see how I painted. I always paint in one hour, and um it's just and you can ask me questions because I have the chat up there in in YouTube. Now I heard that people who use iPads they can't chat because for some reason they can't uh, chat or something. So. Uh, but those of many have been with me ever since the first day and they're getting pretty darn good. And it's like, they just um, use it at their own time, their own time. Cause you don't have to watch it on Thursday either live. I, I do it live, but you don't have to watch it live. And most people just watch, they don't paint along, even though I call it paint along, but they sooner or later paint it. And then they go to my website 
or, or to my Facebook page. I have a Facebook page, and then actually Linda Kemp told me to get this one. Um, it's um, Becker Art Group, and um, I know Linda. Linda has her own um, um, negative painting um, page on, on Facebook. Well, I have one called Becker Art Group, and that's where you post all your paintings that you do. And if you want questions answered, um, so that we will all like to see what you're painting. So if you go to um, Becker Art, everything's Becker Art. Um, so Facebook at Becker Art Group, and then you go there and you you post it. And it's private group, so you can't get in unless you know you sign up for it and stuff. Because people don't want to show this stuff to the public. Public, but we just there, and and a lot of people have made friends. It's really kind of neat. I've watched them become friends online. And then they meet at one of my workshops and that's kind of neat because it's like, oh, you're so-and-so from online and stuff. And because I'll be chatting on the side and I'll be hearing them talk to each other and I listen to what they're saying. Oh, Dave's going to be here. You going to, you want to go to this workshop and he's going to be in this town this week or whatever this month. So it's fun. It's really fun. And I also, every Thursday, um, I now I'm, it used to be beers, but now I'm just, I'm, I'm testing a drink. I give it one to 11 paintbrushes. And so um, <laughs> last week it was a, last week it was this, it was this um, Kentucky coffee, hard, cold brew. Yeah. And it tasted just like um, iced coffee, <laughs> but it had whiskey in it. <laughs> so it was like 9% <laughs> proof, but it was actually very good. I gave it a, I think I gave it a 9.5 paintbrush. <laughs> so, so I'm always drinking something too. And it's in the evening. And so we're always having fun. And people mm -hmm. ask, they don't talk to me, but they, they um, chat. They, they chat underneath and it's live and uh, I answer their questions. I try to I always look over and see what they're chatting about. And, um, and, and then I'm hoping they do some of it. They try it and they, they have a lot of them trying it. So now I average about 95 people um, a night that um, are just paying a lot. And they're always not the same because sometimes people are not available, but it's out there. And, and a lot of times people will not watch the live, but they'll still do the, they'll do the painting because I give an assignment this week. The assignment is you can go to my, I'll go to my website here again. And so this week's assignment is to do the, um, the Bob's blobs people. And so if I go to my website and actually I got to go back, let's see. If I go back to here. So if I go to, um, this is the picture we're painting. Uh, actually it doesn't show here. So this is, um, it's a street scene and we're using like Thomas Schaller kind of um, method of doing people and the darks in the front. And as you go back, it gets lighter. I don't know if you can see that. It's um, pretty small here, but this is, um, that's what we're painting this week. And you just go here, it says live in 22 hours. So it'll be live and you just click on this. You go to my website and click on here if you don't want to get my newsletter. And my newsletter is also down here. If you don't want to sign up for my newsletter, you can still get them. Here's archived of all my newsletters. So if you go here, it'll take you to the newsletter. But again, it's not going to take you there on this on this uh, site. But you just go here, and I'll, I archive 400 of them right now. I'm up to 400 newsletters. <laughs> so every week I've been doing it. And so there's all, also some kind of video a lot of times or something there. So just go to my website, and everything's on my website. Like the days that's happening, when I'm on live, all it's at right here. See right up here? It says... Paint along will be this Thursday, March 14th, 6.30, Central Standard Time. Click on the YouTube link. So just do that and you're in. There's no cost. There's nothing to the cost of it. I just do it because it's fun. And, I, and I've and i gotten a lot of people to become pretty good, and good artists. And it's pretty, really kind of rewarding when you see people get really good. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, David. Yeah, it was great. So I would suggest everybody just to go to his website and just uh, look around. I've been on it and it's it's pretty amazing. There's a lot of stuff on it. And, uh, if you really and definitely go to my YouTube channel. That's the yeah. most important. Go to my YouTube channel and just subscribe. If you're on YouTube, subscribe to it because then you're going to find out any time I'm out. Because sometimes what I'll do is I'll do a improv thing where I'm just all of a sudden outside and I want to do a plein air painting. And so I'll just, I'll be taking a hike or something and I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to paint this. And so I'll just put my camera on it. And then the, uh, it's amazing how many people are just on their phone and it gives them a warning. It tells them, oh, Dave's live right now. And um, he's live in so-and-so and I'll just be doing, I'll do a, a demonstration somewhere. And a lot of times I'm away, like uh, this, the one Thursday, I will not have one probably because I'm at Canuga. So there's some Thursdays I switch it to like another day because that week is I'm busy or I will, will not have one that week depending on how busy I am with a workshop. Thank you, David. It was great to see you again. Nice to see you too, Margaret. Thank, Thank you. you. It was Fantastic. wonderful. 
Yeah, thanks. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Enjoy thank the rest you. of your evenings. All right, you guys Bye. too. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Yes, awesome. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.